everyone. Welcome to The Other Side of Addiction. I am your host, Al Richards. Again, we apologize for the backdrop. I know you guys are used to a fancy studio with a nice wood back and fake trees in the background. However, a lot of our listeners know that we are going through a studio change right now, and we're still looking for a place to set up a new studio. So please bear with us, and, and we're very, very grateful for your patience. We have a very special guest today with us. We have Dr. Marin Wright Voss. She is a health scientist. She's also an author, a thinker, and a lecturer. She has completed multiple master's degrees and doctoral degrees in psychology and health science. She began her work at Utah State University as one of the pilot faculty members in the Health, health Extension Advocacy Research and Teaching, abbreviation HEART, initiative. Dr. Voss is the project director on four federal grants and has received $7 million in funding to support health extension programming in the last three years. As project director for the Opioid Impact Family Support Program, she trains certified peer support specialists statewide. She runs a pilot pain education and community empathy, abbreviation PEACE program for community pain management. Dr. Voss and Hart faculty have received dozens of awards for her innovative work in addressing health and wellness needs in Utah, including best of state in 2022. Her research and programming has focused on reducing the impacts of the opioid crisis on a community level with a focus of rural communities. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Marin Voss. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. Wow. Best of state in 2002. What, what an honor, right? Yeah, 2022. So just or last 2022. year. Yes, excuse yeah. me, 2022. Yeah. 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 Um, it's been amazing to work with extension. If people don't know about Utah State University's extension system, it's um, out in all the communities, serving the communities in any way we can to improve lives. And it's because of their networks, I think, that we've been able to have some really positive public health impacts, which is why we won Best of State. So um, it's been a great group to work with. Yeah. And, and again, congratulations on that. And it, when I read that you also help train people to be certified peer support specialists. So my wife has been trained. She has her certificate and, you know, she battled alcoholism for about seven years and she's 20, 27 months sober now and decided that she wanted to get out of the accounts payable that she's done for 17, 18 years and go out there and start helping other people. And that's what it takes for those that are in recovery is people like yourself who see a need and want to go out there and help people. And I'm just so blessed to be able to do this show, be in front of so many incredible people like yourself, see my wife grow, see my own self grow and learn a lot more about ad addiction. And she got her training from USARA there, downtown Salt Lake City. And uh, she works at Odyssey House. She just loves it. She loves how they, and it's crazy because my wife went there during her recovery and she got kicked out twice. She couldn't stand the place. And now she's working for him. So how ironic is that? <laughs> Well, and that's why you need a peer because she knows what it's like on that other side. That's what, probably why you titled your podcast, The Other Side of Addiction. She knows what it's like. And so then she as a peer can help people through. Yeah. Yeah. You know, something that, that was just mentioned in your bio, how you are doing this research for the opioid juice, right? And you're getting it out there in the community. Are you the one that kind of came up with this and wanted to start something? So where did that come from? Yeah, so um, I started at Utah State University in 2017, and as I was finishing uh, my second doctorate degree um, and coming out to work in the public health field from an academic um, setting and perspective, it was right as the opioid crisis was really hitting hard, and so um, they were opening up new opportunities to work with opioid harm reduction. So I joined the faculty there with this focus on opioid harm reduction, and one of the first things you have to do is go into the communities and hear what the problems are and hear what's already been 
being done, who's working on the problems and what other kind of help is needed. So, um, you know, you mentioned your wife um, got trained with you, Sara. And Evan Doan just was chatting with me. He's, um, I think, their marketing public relations expert there. Yeah. And and he was just reminding me of this message I've heard so many times before, nothing about us without us. And like the, the direction, the focus really needs to come from people who've been impacted and who are in that recovery community. And so me coming from an academic background, like I'm not going to be the driver in figuring out what needs to happen. I have to listen to the people that are impacted. So of course, that's where I started. And one of the first people that um, I came to interact with um, was a man named Adam Baxter. He was in the recovery community. He'd started Young People in Recovery out in Tooele County, and he cared enough to bring Recovery Day to his community that hadn't happened out there in Tooele. And so he was willing on his own to host this, to go get the park permits, um, that kind of stuff. So he was starting this big um, endeavor to support the recovery community because he knew how important it was. And just over time, I'm um, sort of trying to support his efforts um, and get the message out in the community. One of the things I he told me was that becoming a peer support specialist um, was something he wanted to do. He just couldn't because he didn't have he couldn't take the time off work. He didn't have the kind of job that would give him vacation days for that. And um, and to travel to go and get the training wasn't feasible. Um, that wasn't a burden he could take on, and yet it was something he would like to do. So I started working with the state about figuring out how to make those trainings more accessible. And so we've done that in a couple ways. One is to create a hybrid training where you can do half the training time online and then just um, come to two days in person to finish your certification out. So we made it more accessible that way. And then the other thing we've been able to do is to acquire some federal funding because um, the health and human services at a federal level realizes how valuable peer support workers are in our behavioral health workforce. And so they've put some workforce development dollars out there. And so we've been able to get that funding to make the trainings more affordable. And then to also give people some support after they finish their training, when they can do some practicum and apprenticeships in behavioral health and work as peers and, and um, develop some work experience. And we can support them along the way there. So I just listened to the community. They told me that was a need. And so that was one of the things, one of our first things we worked on. Wow, that is really cool. And the information you just shared, Dr. Marin, is really good to know. And, and the reason why is um, we have partnered up. The Other Side of Addiction has partnered up with USARA. We we support them 100%. My wife worked with USARA during her recovery with, with Evan, with mostly with Tiffany Nakarado, who is just amazing. I also want to become a certified peer support specialist. And, and the reason why is to help me understand addiction. And now I battled like my own addiction back in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. right? And I didn't look at myself as an addict because I only did it on Friday and Saturday. It was only two days a week. However, I did it for eight years, two days a week for eight years straight. And I've got to understand a little bit more about addiction by the guests that we've had on the show. However, I want to understand more. And, and I was asking Tiffany, I'm like, Hey, do you think it would be a good idea if I became a certified peer support specialist? She goes, Oh my gosh, Al, yes, that would be so great. And it would really help you with your shows and, and help you understand the guests that are coming in a little bit more. And it's the same thing. What other people have told you. I'm not able to take a week off of work mm -hmm. to do it. Now I take Thursdays off so I can do the show. And sometimes I take a half a day off on Wednesdays. My boss is everyone I work with is in recovery. So the boss that I work for, he doesn't want me to stop doing what I'm doing. And he's there to support me hundred percent. However, I'm not able to lose a week's worth of pay. <laughs> you right, know? Right. So know. it's good to know that I could, I could still apply, right? Right. Yeah. And do so, this. Yeah, we worked with the state and we, you know, hand in hand to make sure that we USU had already been putting running a 40 hour training program that was five days in person. USARA's is also five days in person. Optum has one that's approved in the state as well that's five days in person. And the state also saw the need for um, a program that what could be more accessible, that could be um, made available to people out in rural areas as well. And so, um, so yeah, so we were able to put together this program. It's officially split 20 hours 
for um, in person and, and 20 hours online. But four of those hours are um, a, a synchronous virtual training. So you do that through Zoom. And so then you can come just two days in person. The last part of the training is 16 hours, two days. Um, so it makes it so much more accessible people. If you're traveling from U- anywhere in Utah, you can usually get up early, drive to the training, um, and then just do one overnight stay and then be able to drive back home at the end of the second day. So it makes it more affordable. Um, we try to move them toward the weekend. Sometimes it's Friday, Saturday, sometimes Saturday, Sunday. Um, but that way people are only having to take maybe one day off work depending on their schedules. So, yeah, so the whole point was to make it accessible and we're being told by, um, the Office of Substance Use and Mental Health that um, they need more of them, um, that we we had been doing um, three a year and they're trying to push us to make sure we get some more out there so that people can get the training and and be a part of that behavioral health support for people in recovery. Wow. So, so basically the program that you're talking about where you can do half it online and, and a couple of days, that's only offered through USU? Yep. USU is the only one that's um, approved in the hybrid format right now. And you can see, I mean, there's so much value to being in person. That's actually one of the reasons they didn't want to put it all online. Family peer support specialists can do their training hundred um, percent through zoom. Um, and the people at the office of substance use and mental health wanted to make sure that, you know, you were getting some of that feel for the personal interaction and the coaching and the role play and the support um, and, and, managing trauma and crisis and all of that. So they wanted to keep some of it in person. Um, so that's why they went to the hybrid version. Huh? Gosh, I wish, uh, there would be a time where you saw would even look at possibly doing that, that, that would be awesome. Cause Tiffany was telling me that they have that problem with a lot of people who want to be certified is they're not able to take a week off of work, you know? And, and if I was at my old job where I was there 24 years, I would have enough PTO. I I could have took a couple months off, <laughs> you right, know, and, right. and gone through the training. However, I don't have that luxury any longer. Yeah. 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 I mean, you saw it. I know at some point they they'd wanted a an eighty hour training because there's just that much. To, I mean, you know, a week is already short for providing someone with a certification. But the whole point is that people have their own lived journey as part of their experience, which is why they don't need a big fancy degree to do this work, but they still need to know about ethics and boundaries and, and crisis and trauma. So how much training time do you need to be able to impart some of that critical information than a lot of the other um, experience they'll get on the job under supervision. But um, it's hard to say 40 hours is already kind of on the short side though. I kind of agree (laughs) with you, sorry on that. Um, but, but we still want to, to make it accessible. And so, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a good program. Well, that's, that's really good to know. That is great information to know just so our listeners. Yeah. Know about it. Right. Cause that, this is the first time I've ever heard of anything like this. So thank you for sharing that information. And, you know, you say that you listen to the community. So I'm going to be the community for a minute. Okay. If, if you're okay with it, I, sure. it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. And it's something that I watched my wife go through. She decided, as I said at the beginning of the show, that she wanted to go out and help other people and be, you know, a certified peer support specialist. And I wanted to back her 100%. She has to fill out an application, right? There has to be a couple people that have to write in, let the state know why we feel this person would be a good peer support specialist. They accept her application. She goes through a week's worth of training. About two weeks later, she gets her certificate, which just thrilled her to death. I mean, she called me at work and she goes, look what I got. Look what I got. She's really excited. And she should be, right? Yeah. So she goes out there and she starts putting in applications for jobs Mm -hmm. at recovery centers. And this is where my feeling is things need to change. She goes out and she, she, she gets interviewed by every single recovery center that she put a job in for. Uh-huh. She was up front and told them what her background was, right? Because most addicts have a background. Uh-huh. And they're like, no, that shouldn't be a problem. Shouldn't be a problem at all. 
so she's like, all right, great. And they're like, oh my gosh, we really want you. We would really like you. And, and we see potential, what you, what you can do to help other people. She's all excited. And I watched this happen to her over and over. They, they get her background back, right? Mm -hmm. And they say, Mrs. Richards, we're sorry. The state will not allow us to hire you because you have an assault charge on your record and also a violation of a protective order, which I'm the one that put the protective order on her. Right. Right. And I'm the one that canceled the protective order. Right. Because she was really working on, on coming back. And I saw this woman who was on this high horse, just gung ho thousand percent of energy. And I watch her just start plummeting Aww. like this. And there were a few nights she just sat here and cried. And she's like, why is it that I finally just, I, I want to do this and I want to help other people. The state accepts my application and then my state denies me, yeah. denies me. Well, a job. I'm not, I'd be curious to know what the agencies are using as the state won't allow um, because that my, my, my guess is that that's an interpretation or that there's flexibility around um, around that. We've definitely seen places, I'm not an expert at all in um, workforce employment HR um, right. regulations, but we've seen places that will have you know, certain types of felonies and misdemeanors are allowed and others aren't. Um, and so they'll have, you know, it's not just that a felony negates your application, but that there's certain types that they'll consider. Anyway, we've seen those types of rules at different types of agencies and employers. Um, we've also seen Division of Workforce Services has a program where they can provide a bond for um, people who have convictions. There's some charge, um, some cost to that. Um, but that way, if a person has theft charges on their background, that can sometimes make employment easier if they have this. It's like a six thousand um, dollar bond um, with the Division of Workforce Services. So there's things that agencies are trying to do to make it easier for people who have a record to be able to get employment. One of the biggest um, things, and I think you've probably heard some regulation and some stories around um, the importance of expungement services um, and um, being able to get those things either, you know, ex just expunged off people's records so yeah. that it's not an ongoing hindrance. Um, but, you know, some agencies will provide employment um, with um, assault charges and other things on a person's background. So it really is agency by agency. So I'm not sure it's the state that's creating that rule, except depending on, you know, the specific conditions or um, populations that they might be working with. Huh. Yeah, because they, they would tell her it would be the state because they're state funded, right? And the state decides who they pretty much get to hire on. So that's, that's, and I'm just going off what they told her and she's telling me, you know, yeah. so I'm just. You know, I'm you're going to need to invite um, a gal, Sharon Cook, I think is her name, um, who I think she also works at the Office of Substance Use and Mental Health and her whole area is workforce employment issues and making sure that um, that people are able to um, get jobs when they have um, mental health or behavioral health backgrounds and histories um, and criminal justice histories. So uh, huh. she would be a good person to be the expert to talk about okay. this and whether or not their state, parts of the state's um, system, whether it's if, if place bills Medicaid, is that the hang up? And so if you're billing for Medicaid, you have to have a certain kind of background. I'm not sure, but she'd be able to, to advise us on that. Awesome. I'll have to look her up and see if I can find her because, yeah, I'd, I'd love to have her on on the show. And it, we we had uh, the Salt Lake City Mayor um, Aaron Mendenhall on our show a couple of weeks ago. And I was kind of talking about it. She's like, yeah, I'm just the mayor of the city. You know, <laughs> I don't have no control over the state. And I'm like, I get it. But I still wanted to voice my opinion on it, you know, just to get it out there. But yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to check that out and and see because, you know, she went to we know uh, Clean Slate Utah as well. And we've had them on the show and, and they checked on it. And there are certain things, like you said, they can expunge and there's certain things that they cannot. And that was one of them. And, and they're also working really hard because they, they know because the gal um, destiny who kind of runs that stuff, 
she had a criminal background, right? Yeah. And so she knows what people are going through while they're in recovery and trying to find a home and trying to find a place to work. And yeah. So, yeah, yeah I heard about clean slate sponsoring an expungement expo um, and they were just mobbed with people. I mean, it's such an important need. Yeah, we were there. They offered us a table and we were there and it was an amazing event. It yeah. really was. There were a ton of people that showed up to get help and, and they need it. Right. And, and it was so cool that there is an organization out there to, to help people to, to do that. I, I also learned over that during that event that the United States is the only country that basically when someone has a record, they keep that record. Mm -hmm. You know, other countries, if you go to jail or you go to prison or you pay your fines or whatever, once you've gone through whatever it is that they've asked you to go through the courts, everything's wiped clean. Mm -hmm. So basically you, you do have a clean slate, so you can go out and get your life on track. However, for some reason here, we like to keep that over their heads. And it's, again, it's just something that I just think our system's broken and it needs to be looked at. And, you know, it's going to take a long time to change it because we've done this for how many years and in my belief, it's not working. But uh, anyway, to kind of get off my high horse on that, what are what are the other things that's really important to you? I mean, we we said a lot in your bio, and you've done so much. And yeah, just what are some of these other things that you could share with our listeners? Well. Still in the area of peer support, um, our programs provide some um, stipend award funding for people that are um, working their way as new peer support specialists and um, helping them get that work experience they need. Because sometimes um, it can, everybody with a recovery background has a different story, different life experiences. Some have finished graduate degrees and have long career histories and others maybe um, don't have that work experience, but the level of professionalism is very different for each peer as they come through the training program. Um, and so one of the things I thought you might've been suggesting as a problem for your wife was how little money a peer might make. Um, and that's one of my concerns. Um, the, the jobs don't always pay that well. And yet these are people who are passionate about giving back and helping others. And so they they do the work more often out of passion than for the pay. Yeah. Um, and yet at the same time, they should get paid well. Um, but because they all have such different backgrounds, just the, the entry level position of a peer support worker often doesn't pay very well at all. And, um, and sometimes um, some of the people have from their backgrounds, they don't always know enough about boundaries and, and how to um, be ethical on the job. And so, so getting individuals who are peer support specialists into positions in emergency departments, in um, hospitals, in the criminal justice system, you're talking about the problem with background um, checks, to get someone to get a job to work at the jail, to provide peer support and, and to be that resource for people who are incarcerated they sometimes have to pass a higher level bar. And so we've been working on creating an advanced certification for peer support specialists. So you might have to come in at an entry level position, but within a couple of years of work experience and professional development trainings, you could get that advanced standing. And then we could have the jails, the hospitals, the doctor's offices feeling um, a little bit more comfortable that they're hiring someone with a level of professionalism that will work for those advanced settings. Um, and so that's some of the work we've been doing. So we're putting people through apprenticeships. The state right now is working on firming up what they think will work for an advanced credential. Um, and hopefully that's something they'll come out with in the next couple of years. Um, because peer support specialists are needed and we need them in the hospitals and, you know, maybe you riding along with the police or the ambulance crews and, and, and all of that in those um, sort of high risk intense settings. That's really good information to hear. Cause again, I really thought that nothing, no one's been working on anything in all yeah. honesty. So yeah, thank you for sharing that information. And, and it makes a lot of sense, right. To have someone who's actually lived it, and then has got the training to go out there to help other people understand it. But if they're only ever going to pay you $14 an hour for that, you can't do that for 
a long time, right? Yeah. And then people are going to leave that profession where um, it would be better if they've had experience to be able to be paid more, to be able to take on supervisory roles. And, and hopefully that advanced credential will create that higher level of professionalism for the peers. Yeah. Now, I, I know there's uh, the state is doing something with my wife. So I think she has to have something like 60 hours. I, I don't know what it is, and I don't want to just guess it, but they will give her a bonus. And it, it's like a $1,500 or a $2,500 bonus if she goes That's through these program. steps, right? Yep, that's our program where um, um, yeah. so um, she's probably finishing a practicum first and it's a twenty five hundred dollar stipend that she'll receive if she completes all of those work hours and the, the supervision requirements and the continuing education requirements. Um, and that's part of that professionalism development pathway. That's not the whole piece. They have to do another a level two phase, which we call an apprenticeship. Um, and if they complete all of that, that should be what the state at some point is going to call their advanced credential. Um, they're they're still working out the details, but um, but down the road, she'll be able to be on track to get that advanced credential. And right now, through our um, grants that we've acquired, um, they're able to get some stipends that help because, again, it's such a low wage. It, people might be tempted to do something else or it may not cover their transportation or child care costs. And so having these stipend awards can help make life livable while they're um, getting this work experience. Yeah, that's that's really good to know. And and like you said, they they don't pay very well. I mean, I I probably make twelve or fifteen dollars more than what my wife does. And to me, she's doing more important work. Right? She's out there helping other individuals. Now, I make other people happy because we do like remodels in their home and things like that. So they're thrilled to death. However, it's not helping people the way that they need to be helped. Yeah, so I agree. Well, with you. every job out there is providing a value or people wouldn't be paid to do it. So I am always impressed with people who are working hard every day, no matter what job they're doing. Yeah. But I absolutely agree. Peer support specialists, there's a special place reserved for them in um, in glory because of the important work they do. Yeah, it's like those that work in care centers, right? Right. I mean, right. those they should be making a ton because it takes a very, very special person to work in one of those places. I be, I know I wouldn't be able to do it. Absolutely. But uh, it definitely takes a special person to do those type of jobs. Absolutely. What kind of research are you guys doing? Uh, you We talked about in your bio about, um, oh, my gosh the the opioid crisis now we've had guests come on our show i just interviewed a gentleman out of i believe north carolina his name's kevin baker by the age of 30 he was making a half a million dollars had the big home beautiful wife kids fancy cars mm -hmm. membership at the country club out playing basketball one day he hurts his back and he's on these painkillers. The painkillers aren't really doing much for him. His lifestyle kind of starts plummeting, right? Because he's having a hard time getting around and, and he can still do his work. However, it's not as easy anymore. He, he did like finances. So it's not like anything physical. And somebody gave him a little blue pill and it was an Oxycontin. And he, he said he had it for about five days and one day he's sitting at home on the computer and, and he keeps looking at it and he's like, you know what, I'm just, I'm going to take it. And he takes it. He said that's the best he had ever felt for so long. That was the start of him losing everything. Right. He went from making a half a million dollars to where he started robbing banks. Wow. He had lost all his money. All the money he had off to the side for his kids' college funds, gone. They started selling things, cars. They started selling furniture. And he kept telling his wife, it's because I've started this new business, which he did start a new business, and it's taking all the funding. He said he was going to the bank and pulling out five to $6,000 every single day. Wow. And it's so he could buy the opioids. He ended up robbing a bank. 30 miles away from his house, $12,000. He went through $12,000 in two weeks. He goes, do you think I spent it on our mortgage to catch up? 
Nope. Any of the other bills? Nope. I spend it all on opioids. Right. Well, so, just your example of a person who seems to have it all in life and then one injury and one you know prescription can take them in such a different direction. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why the opioid crisis has received so much attention in the United States. That alongside of opioids are so risky in um, creating overdose deaths mm -hmm. um, just because of the way it suppresses breathing and the person will just, you know, pass out and, and, and not wake up. Um, so, so the overdose deaths combined with it's hitting all sectors of society at a level that we just haven't seen with some of the other drugs of abuse. Um, and so I think those two things together make it so that more people wake up, take notice. They're, they're more likely to know someone who's had this hit them um, in the family and in the home. And so more people have started to realize we have to do something about this. And so on one level, um, that's it's, it's discouraging that it took um, this to wake people up, but it's been a huge opportunity because people now realize that it's not a moral failing to have experienced an addiction because there's people who they know who've, you know, worked hard and been dedicated and sacrificed and, um, you know, had good values. And they, they, these people that seem to be living life the right way, and they can be hit just as hard as someone who comes um, to it from, from less fortuitous circumstances. And so it's not a moral failing that creates the addiction. So at least we have that to build upon um, as we go forward with understanding addiction. So I think there's been the opportunity to reduce stigma. And, and I think maybe some of the reforms we're seeing around criminal justice and, um, you know, arrests for um, substance possession, I think are because people realize that um, the addiction is so powerful that that's what's controlling people's behavior more than their willpower. Yeah. And you are, you're so spot on with that, just from learning a lot more that I, that I've learned and having these guests on, right. It's, it's really not the drugs or the alcohol, the opioids or, or the eating or the porn, whatever it is. It's just the band-aids, right. Cause it's not yeah. really who they are. And, and I, I like to use, I like to use, I'm a big eagle and hawk fan. I just I just love the animals because you know they're they're mates for life and the just the nature of them, graceful. However, when they go down to grab something with their talons, their claws, they are so strong and they can go in so deep because they're so sharp. I like to use that as picturing that as the addiction because when they get in there. Bef and most of the time, most people who battle the addiction, especially with the opioids, before they know it, those talons are sunk so deep, they do not know how to get them out. Yeah. And and they try and they they may get them loose a little bit and start feeling a little bit better. But, you know, that muscle tightens back up and it just grabs them again. And and I used to I used to tell my wife all the time, you love alcohol more than you love me. And she's like, no, I don't. But that's how I saw it. Right. 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 And on the other side, because I didn't understand addiction. And I didn't realize she had all this pain, all this past trauma that she was bottling up that finally got full. Right. It hit its peak and it started overflowing. And all she wanted to do was get rid of it. And the only way she could get rid of it was to drink. Right. And it just made it worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Again, not, not a failing of willpower, not a failing of love, um, but just that grip of the addiction. That's well said. Yeah. And, and I love that you brought up the word stigma. That is one of our goals here on the other side of addiction podcast is to get rid of that stigma. You know, and I want to share something really quick. We were invited last summer to, uh, it was like a neighborhood protest. And it was in West Jordan, Utah, where I grew up as a young boy. And I've been very active in the community. And I'm like, absolutely, we're going to go. My wife and I show up to this. And what it is, is they were bringing in a sober living in this community. Oh, right, right. So the neighborhood was protesting, right? They did not want a sober living. And again, I'm not knocking them down because, again, they don't understand, right? 
Dr. Marion, I, I tell you, it was like it was like watching the movie Frankenstein, right? When this when the town is going after the monster. I was so shocked. It was triggering my wife so bad. She's like, oh. I got to leave. I, I cannot be here. And she walked around the corner where we had our vehicle parked and went over there. I mean, there were people yelling and screaming and their fists up in the air. And there were there was a gal who works for APNP or used to work for APNP. And she got up there and she goes, I know what type of people come through there and they're nothing but a piece of garbage. And I mean, and I started getting irritated and her husband started mouthing off and he's standing right next to me. And I says, oh, you think you know everything about addiction, huh? And you think you know about these people? There are people who love these people. And when they come to a sober living, they're working the program, right? They're there to get their lives back on track. And he just basically just told me to F off. Seriously. Wow. Wow. And the mayor was there and got up and was talking. And there were certain people who were there to get the neighborhood to say, look, this is why we're doing this. It's not what you guys think. And the mayor, who I know, gave me the opportunity to get up and talk. And Man, if I had that kind of power when I'm on stage talking about addiction as I did that day, I would probably be a huge hit because it just come out and literally it just hushed everybody up. So, again, the stigma of what people think. And again, it's just not having the right education, right? And I'm just as guilty. I'm not innocent. I've done it my, myself, and it's taken me time to know more about this addiction stuff and what people go through, and it doesn't discriminate. Right. Some of these people come from very happy homes, very good childhoods. Others have not. Others have been sexually assaulted. Others came from a home where addiction was in their home. There's so many stories, and people just don't realize it. Yeah. And I, like I said I, earlier, I think that's one of the benefits that's come from the opioid crisis is that it's hitting more families in a way where people are starting to realize that they need to have a compassionate, different approach. Um, I was just talking yesterday with um, the narcotics um, task force head out in Twila, and he was talking about his own journey on overcoming stigma. So he used to arrest people for um, substance possession and and over time, he said he would, he'd, he'd take their stash and then they would realize that um, the person, once they, they wouldn't go to jail time, once they'd be released, they'd be, you know, doing property theft again to get money, to be able to buy the substance um, to feed their craving. And he ended up realizing he wasn't really doing any good by arresting individuals for possession. And, and so he started to learn and look toward, you know, he had to to go toward the dealers and track things down and try to get the arrest against the dealers because they were the ones creating the harm. Um, and that really the individuals just like in that, that grip of the talents is such a good analogy that you gave They're They're just in the grip of the addiction and they're just doing what they feel like they have to do to survive. And so there's no ill intent, um, in their behavior, um, and it's, you know, to look at that as a moral failing and that they need to be thrown in jail isn't very helpful for society. And so he's had that personal turnaround and that stigma reduction um, perspective. Um, one of the things groups we work with in the rural areas is um, the law enforcement and first responder segment. Um, and they're dealing with these problems every single day. Um, and it can be really easy when you're faced with those hard situations to, um, to develop a, a tough skin and to, um, you know, blame the victim or to um, just, you know, feel like um, people should do more um, to, to prevent these messes from happening in the first place. Um, so when we go in and we provide that information, all the things you've just been talking about and that I'm sure your podcast covers of like, here's how you can understand addiction and here's um, the, what happens to a person's brain. And, um, and then when you show them the treatments for um, opioid use disorder, if we can provide individuals with medication that it covers the 
um, opioid response so that they're not um, feeling cravings, but it doesn't give them the same high because um, they're partial agonists. And um, if we can give these individuals medication on a long-term basis, then they can get back to their productive lives. They can get back to healing. And that, that medication, it's not um, giving the people drugs, which is what some people seem to think it is. It's it's like a, a person with diabetes giving them the insulin that they need. Yeah. Um, and so we, we train the first responders and the law enforcement on um, those perspectives and, and it really is just a little bit of a mental shift that's needed for them to understand. And, and then they can have that slightly more compassionate, caring attitude. They just like, it's hard to keep that every day when you're facing such hard situations, but just to remind them how important that perspective is every time they go out and work in um, a community crisis and, and to get the people the help they need. Um, I know there's a lot of communities in Utah that are starting to, um, push for diversion centers where instead of putting a person in jail and and making an arrest, they could take them to um, a a center where the person still has to follow some rules and has to um, be processed. And, but they're getting resources that they need and support rather than um, going to jail. So there's more communities pushing for that. Um, And I think that all fits with this idea of reducing the stigma, getting people the help they need. That is really good to know. I'm so happy to hear that because, again, jail doesn't do anything, right? Now, there are some who have broken some major laws and hurt other individuals, right? I I get that. However, my wife was thrown in jail quite a few times for things that, I mean, for her drinking, really. And she was put in like the C block. And there are some pretty mean people in C block whose life has been nothing but causing chaos in the community. And I remember a time she'd call me up. She's just bawling. She goes, I don't know if I'm going to make it out of here because, you know, she's so innocent. She's an alcoholic, right? She's an alcoholic other than what her DUI that she got, which is breaking the law, got her license pulled away, but she's doing time in jail with people who are out there hurting other people. And yeah, it scared the living crap out of her. Well, let me tell you one other perspective on jail, though, that I heard. Um, so this is in Tooele Jail. And so I don't know how this relates to other jails, but we actually did interviews that Tooele County Health Department had done a focus group project. And so they'd met with people who um, were in recovery from substance use, their family members. And then they also met with a group of people who were currently um, using substances and, and hadn't gone into recovery yet. And they heard several stories from people in all three groups that said jail was a lifesaver for either the individual or a loved one. We didn't hear any negative reports of the experience of jail. So again, this might just be anecdotal for Tooele County. And I actually interviewed one gal who had said she had gone to the judge and um, at her sentencing and said, I've tried everything. Um, there's, I'm going to be back out using again. I'm going to be stealing and getting money for the drugs. Um, she's like, you're going to have to lock me up and you're going to have to lock me up for a while if you want this to stop. So um, again, it's not a failure of willpower. She had been using all the willpower she could muster and she could not escape the grip of addiction. And she was a person that found going to jail for more than 30 days gave her the time and the space she needed to get onto a recovery pathway. And we heard that story from people again and again, that they didn't see jail as punitive, but they saw it as a step toward their recovery. Um, I think that in and out um, of two or three days um, arrests that we sometimes see probably are not creating the kind of same helpful interaction. But anyway, I just share that because for some people, some instances, jail ended up being a positive experience as well. That's, that's good to hear too. I just know that where my, where, where they put my wife, it, yeah. And and she, she actually came home and she goes, I can tell you now where to buy every drug there is. Mm -hmm. I know exactly where to go. If I was that type of person, right. If she was a person who used as well as drank, she would be able to know. And uh, yeah. So yeah, maybe their jail is a good thing. Well, and to some extent, like jail is like, it was 
a proxy for treatment for people that maybe didn't have treatment um, options. But the problem with some of our treatment program options is that people can walk away at any time. So if it gets stuck tough at day 10, yeah. they can exit. Um, and so jail takes away that option. So I'm not sure where that takes us on how to get people the help they need. But for there's a subset that find jail is part of what they need. Huh. Well, it's it's good to hear that there's some new things out there. And uh, I also just did a, a quick little short video here not too got not too long ago. I just signed up for TikTok, which I've swore I wasn't going to get on it. And people are like, you need to do it. It'll help your show and do these quick little blurps. So I, I did one on insurance the other day. And, and I learned this from Dave DeRocher, the executive director out there at the Other Side Academy, downtown Salt Lake. And he brought up this comment. He goes, who decides how long someone stays in recovery? I'm like, gosh, and I, I should have known this, right? Yeah. And and I'm like, um, well, the individual? And he goes, no, the insurance companies. And I went, oh my gosh, you are so right. My pet peeve again here is why do we leave the life of our loved ones in the hands of insurance companies, right? Because they determine whether it's 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, six months. Mm -hmm. That ain't even close to long enough right? when you're going through recovery. So anyway, I just kind of wanted to throw that out there as well. And, and I want to respect your time. We've, gosh, we're literally almost 10 minutes away from doing an hour already. And, and I know you have another meeting. Dr. Mary, the, the information you shared today was awesome. I mean, thank you for getting that out there. Please send me whatever links that you have so I can attach it to the to the show notes when this show airs, because I want people to know where they can go, what resources are out there. Are are you here in, in Salt Lake or are you in Logan? I'm in the Salt Lake office um, okay. for my statewide peer support training programs um, and then also work out in Tooele for some of the rural health programs we do. You know, and I'm just going to say it right here on the show. I tip my hat off to those in Tooele because first of all, you just talked about an officer out there, right? Who saw something that needed to change. I have a friend that I met years ago when I was working for the West Jordan Chamber of Commerce. She has a daughter who came up with this new program. Her daughter's in prison and her daughter come up with this new program. Well, the Tooele Police Department has implemented this program. And they're seeing a huge change. And I've been wanting to get the chief of police there from there to come on the show and talk about why they're doing this. Let's make it happen. Tuila has been, I've seen the amazing prevention work, community policing, um, community coalitions. I mean, they're just, um, they're a community that really tries to pull together and and make things better for everyone. So um, I think that's a great idea. Get them on there and let's let's find out what they're doing and, and how we can all learn from it. Yeah, please do. So if you do have any kind of connections, please let me know. My, my friend's going to see if she can help me out as well because, yeah. And again, it's really cool that her daughter came up with this program while in prison and, and they took it on, right? And, and they've used her as well as an example to say, it's making a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would love to have find out more. Love to have them on the show to get that information out there. What is it that you can share with our listeners? What would be a main message for you today to share for our listeners to, to grasp hold of? Well, I think part of the sort of stigma reduction idea, realizing that, um, that addiction isn't a failure of willpower is such an important message, but all of us are impacted by pain and, and particularly for the opioid crisis, that's a pathway that gets so many people into addiction. Um, and so as a society, we should probably be looking at some of the alternative ways to manage our pain beyond the pill um, that the doctor can prescribe. Um, so we've been working with trying to have some of the community-based approaches, some of the medical treatments, um, they, they can do some, but they can't get us totally out of our pain, which is why people prescribe the opioids. So there's um, pain management strategies people can learn and practice at home. Um, they can You can use a conjunction with your medical treatments in order to avoid the risk of addiction. Um, and so I'm hoping that people start to 
reconsider how we're managing our pain and and look at the alternatives and and have a healthy holistic approach to um, pain in our society. And I think that that'll that'll really help us as we also deal with the addiction side. That is a great message. Yeah, we've had a few people come on our show and talk about um, is it functional functional medicine? But it's the holistic type stuff, right? So it's it's yeah, it's it's really good. It's I'm glad to see that there are some places that's opening up their doors going, look, there's a healthier way of doing this. Right, right. Yeah, and, and I mean, our forefathers, right, or the Native Americans back in the days, they didn't jump on their horse and go down to their local pharmacy to pick anything up, right? right. They right. had to manage their pain with herbs and different different holistic things that they did. And it's been around for thousands of years, but man have just kind of come in and learned how to make synthetic things to, of course it happens quicker, right? I mean, when you're in really bad pain, it's nice to get out of pain as quick as possible. So there, there has been some pluses, but uh, yeah, with the opioids, especially, and I'm sure you've watched the the series dope sick mm-hmm. on Hulu, which is amazing. It's an eight part series with Michael Keaton and it. it's just an amazing series. And you know, the opioids, I think, has really increased the heroin addiction, right? Because it's it's the same high. It's the exact same high and it's cheaper. Right. So anyways. Exactly. Yeah. And one of the things you see is that opioids work great for short-term acute pain and not very well on chronic pain. They they actually, if you measure people's pain levels across the day and weeks and months, when you're taking opioids on a long-term, you're actually not reducing your pain, overall pain. Um, there's some biological mechanisms that come into play where you're, it increases your pain in other ways. And so it's just not a good solution long-term. So yeah, we just got to look at some other options. Yeah. I like it. Dr. Marion, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for being on the show and all the information that you shared. And most of all, thank you for everything that you're doing. You're, you're another person that we've had on this show that's making a difference out there. So I just want to make sure that you're seeing our gratitude for it, right? It's, we're just very blessed and grateful that there are people out there that care because these people who are battling these addictions, they're another human being that someone loves and cares about. They're just lost. They need some help. A lot of times they don't know where to turn to. So they need people like yourselves and our other guests that come on the show to go here. Let me help you. We'll, we'll take it. It down. takes, takes a community. So thanks for what you're doing as well. And, and all together, we'll try to get um, the support and the change needed to, to take care of our loved ones. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Another great show. Thank you for your time. Thank you for all your support. Thank you to all our sponsors who's made this possible. Thank you, Resilience Talk Network and everyone behind the scenes. Guys, hopefully here in the next couple of weeks, we'll be back up in another beautiful studio. Thank you for being patient. Thank you to all our guests, our guest co-hosts who come on. Ah, Just all our listeners, man, I could sit and say thank you over and over. You guys have watched the show. You know how many thank yous I say at the end of the show. So I'm just so blessed to be doing this. Guys, remember, addiction is giving up everything for one thing, and recovery is giving up one thing for everything. We're out.